This is 10 Questions to Cyber Resilience, brought to you by Assurance IT. Released twice per month, every episode brings you one step closer to cyber resilience by hearing how IT leaders are practicing cybersecurity. Resources mentioned in the episode can be found in the show notes. If you're ready to take your cyber resilience to the next level, be sure to subscribe so you can catch every episode. Welcome, Franco, to our podcast here at Assurance IT. Before we get started, I would ask you to maybe just introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about who Franco is, what you do on a day-to-day, and how you got here on this podcast. Yeah, sure. So I've been in IT for probably nearly 15 years now, and probably half of those were in security. I'm really a typical jack-of-all-trades. My background was in programming. I realized early on I didn't like programming. So I went into the networking side. And then going into the networking side, doing some sysadmin, some network admin, then I landed myself into purely cybersec. On the cybersec side, I've done identity access management, I've done incident response, and now I'm currently doing a content dev, which is basically writing rules into seams for large corporations. So wow. now I'm doing consulting with Bell Canada. I've been with them for nearly four years, and it's very interesting. You're working with big, big projects with big budgets. It's fun. It's fun. And you're dealing with projects which really affect all of Canadians, which is very interesting. Yeah, interesting. And writing policies for a large enterprise is definitely not the same as writing a policy for a small enterprise or mid-market enterprise. But I think the the principles are all all the same. And the reason why we started talking and and I asked you to join the podcast is because there's a big challenge in the small business world today. We talk a lot about small businesses and how they need to protect themselves. And that's why I think we found that our topic obviously today is going to gravitate towards smaller, mid-sized businesses. I want to start with a really shocking stat or a phrase that I've come across. Nearly half of Canadian small businesses do not allocate any budget to cybersecurity. That's a pretty shocking statement. Would you agree if you heard that offhand? Absolutely. You know, I was saying that my background is really with these large corporations, but I have done consulting for smaller businesses as well. Some very small businesses and some medium size. I really seen it all when it comes to that space. I won't name names, obviously, but I've seen some law firms with very, very loose IT security. But going back to your question, I believe it. It's sad, but I believe it, especially knowing that breaches cost so much money, even for smaller businesses. Uh, I was reading that I think nearly half of breaches for small businesses are starting at around 100,000 to get them back on their feet. And that doesn't even take into account the non-tangible costs, right? So reputational risk and yeah, the reputational risk is the big yeah, one. Yeah, credibility, reputational risk. I like those. Those are non-tangible, hard to put a number associated with it, depending on the type of business you're in, are you B2B, B2C? That makes a huge difference. Be- before we dive into the actual small business, maybe just di- defining the small business, because I think depending on the audience sure. and where you live. So typically when I hear small business, obviously it could be anywhere from one employee to a couple of hundred employees. If we talk about an empl- a small business, 100, 200, 300, even 500, hundred employees in some places that's considered small business. They struggle with a lot of things. One of the things that I often hear, and I'd like your input on this, is we often f- struggle with finding actual talent, which attracting and retaining the IT talent or the IT professional required to properly protect the business. It's a smaller business. They don't have the same name, the same glamour. So as a small business, how would you recommend they attract good sure. IT talent? Sure. Well, being a small business isn't really a disadvantage versus the the Bell Canada's of the world. You just have to be more creative, I think. The fact that you are working for a smaller business, you get to touch on many more technologies. If you want to dive into a new project, you'll probably have much more access to that versus a big business where there's more silos, there's more politics, there's more red tape. So there's that. And also you could be creative in terms of work-life balance. You could probably do some more hybrid type of working. If you think outside the box, it's not really just about throwing money at talent. These days, they're also looking for, uh, say, secondary perks. Yeah, you mentioned work-life balance. You're right about that. There's a different mindset. I mean, like it or not, small business, large business, large enterprise, there is a different mindset. And some folks that I've come into contact with prefer being able to do a lot of everything like you mentioned, be able to touch right. a lot of different technologies versus when you're in a large enterprise and you're kind of stuck in your little bubble or box or silo. And that's kind of the job you do. So that's a good point. I appreciate that. For large businesses, there's been this whole notion of how much of your actual revenue should be attributed to cybersecurity. Have you ever been asked that question? Like how much, if I'm a small business, I've got 50 employees, I've got hundred employees, how much of my revenue should I attribute to a cybersecurity budget? Is there an actual absolute number in your opinion or how would you answer that? It's hard, I'd say, to put everyone in the same category, right? If you're a company that's 
I don't know, let's just say I'm doing some renovations on my house lately. So let's say you're an installer of doors. You don't have the same sensible data as a, an accounting firm, even though you might be the same number of people working there. So I think you have to just be a bit more mindful of the type of data you come in contact with on a regular basis. With that being said, even if your budget is small, I would start with the fundamentals. You have to make sure that your backups are in place, make sure that all your systems are up to date. Those are the very, very least you could do. But make sure that, that your backups are in place is important, but actually restoring them is even more important. So going through those exercises. That's a good point. Let's kind of unpack that a little bit. So again, a small business, it could be a couple hundred employees as well. They come sure. and see me and they say, you know, I've got a small IT staff. I've got one, two people, maybe I've got an external consultant that comes in. Where do I start? For me, I gravitate towards three or four different areas. You've already mentioned backup. What other things would you recommend to a small business who's just starting out, who just needs to have a basic security posture in place? What would be maybe some areas that you could recommend quickly? Well, for starters, I would make them get a general lay of like the land. So just to see what's happening and they should go to a third party. They should go to a company like yours and you guys could give them the lay of like the land and they could see, okay, maybe the backups aren't there. Or maybe you do them weekly instead of daily, whatever gaps are there, maybe an instant, a, an, an actual plan in case anything happens. So if you get hacked, what do you do? Cause like it, an incident response plan. Exactly. Because if people seem to think that the IT guy at their company is the 360 so solution, and that isn't the case, because I mean, generally he's thinking about the day to day of running your business, be it setting up workstations or making sure that your servers are running fine, but he's not thinking about the legal ramifications of any kind of a breach or what does the CEO do? Do we have to get PR involved? There's so many more things than just technical. So I would really say, get a third party in there to really give you the right approach. Cause if you would just assume that your IT person is taking care of it, chances are that there's going to be gaps there. A lot to do on a day-to-day -day basis. You're right. Just keeping the lights Absolutely. on is a full-time job for a lot of people. It, I'll also add a little bit there and, and I'd like your opinion on this. So in terms of big, biggest priorities, when a business comes to us and says, what do I do? I don't know where to start. Right? So these are my top three or four. And I'd like you to maybe comment on those. We often recommend security awareness training for their employees. Awareness is definitely important. And I'd like your feedback on that. And then of course you mentioned backup a couple of times. That's the last line of defense is backup, but I think backup is underappreciated in a lot of organizations. Then you have multi-factor authentication. I mean, customers still today just use a simple password to log into a lot of other platforms. What's your opinion on MFA and VPN? Can you maybe just unpack that a little bit and tell us what you think about all that? I mean, with the MFA in terms of that, it's becoming more and more widespread across all platforms, which is nice. Banking is making it more and more standard, which is a good thing. But I think many people aren't even at that level yet in the sense that there, there's still breaches you see because of a default passwords. There's still breaches because of shared passwords or reuse passwords. So MFA is great, but there's a lot of basic cyber hygiene, let's say that has to be done. And the training for the personnel is really a great place to start, right? Cause uh, as you know, most breaches happen by human error or human entry. I don't know about you, but I'm getting a lot more text messages from a lot more weird numbers on my phone every day, trying to deposit money into my bank account or telling me that I've got a bill that's unpaid or whatever. And I mean, the social phishing aspect is becoming mm -hmm. so prominent right now. So that's why the awareness training for me is a must. Oftentimes it's overlooked. So that, that's one of the things I recommend a lot of companies. Yeah, absolutely. More often than not, I, I tell p people, you know, for family, my mom who clicks on anything, I'll tell her like, if you're not expecting to receive an email from someone, like it probably isn't for you, you know, no one's going to send you money by email, just randomly. <laughs> Microsoft is not emailing you. Uh, so they're not giving so, you a thousand bucks if you share this with any of your friends. Is that exactly. what you're <laughs> Sadly not. I'll remember that one. But uh, yeah, I think fundamentally speaking at an individual level, like you said, even outside the workplace, I think that's where it starts. I'm going to go one level deeper here from an educational perspective. I think this should be taught in schools. I think we should be teaching this to children at a younger age, especially now that they're always on their phones or mobile or devices and so on. I think there's some kind of awareness level that needs to be augmented personally. And I think that's not happening at the level it should be. So you're right. I think we need to be telling a lot more people about it for sure. Maybe as a newer generation, they're growing up with tech. Unlike we're kind of on the cusp, we're close mm -hmm. to the same age. So we picked it up later on in life, but now you're seeing kids that are under 10 that are 
really pro proficient with the cell phones, the iPads, computers. So I think it will be better, but there's definitely still a lot of catching up to do. Yeah. I'm not here to knock the education system. That's definitely not my goal here, but I think there's some level of awareness just in general, because there's a lot of this technology that's out there. And I think if we instill it in, in the children or the adolescents at a younger age, at least they understand potential risks associated with just going online and downloading anything onto your smartphone and then accepting all the terms and conditions and clicking. I think clicking has become just a normal thing for folks. Like it's click right. and ask questions later to your point earlier. I think we need to ask questions about who's supposed to be contacting us or are we expecting anything versus, you know, clicking. So yeah, awareness training for me is something top of mind. I mean, it has to be done on a regular basis, right? You can't just do it once and then put it on a shelf. Exactly. Periodically on a yearly basis. And of course, measuring that. I had a customer of mine a while back says, Hey, Luigi, I need a security awareness training program. And you know, we partnered with our great vendor and we were recommended to him and he was questioning the investment. He says, well, can't you just point me to a couple of videos on YouTube? And I said, well, how do you measure your employees actually did that? But how do you measure? How do you track that? How do you put that into a performance evaluation? Right. And these are individuals who are responsible for the well being of their business. So. A lot of education that remains to be done. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's becoming more and more, people are taking cyber risk a lot more serious as I talk to pe people on a day-to-day -day basis, even if it's not necessarily clients, even just friends or family or whoever I uh, end up meeting, it's becoming more prevalent uh, versus yeah. three, four or five years ago. Yeah, I agree. I guess the movement is working for some, it looks like it is. So this is a tough question. The next question I had was for small businesses, how can you assess some of their vulnerabilities? A lot of people don't know what they don't know. And especially right. in a smaller business where to your point earlier, there's a lot of things going on in a day to day, your IT personnel is probably overwhelmed like a lot of us. So where would you start to assess some of the vulnerabilities and where do you think some of the weak or the blind spots are today? I mean, one of the first things I always do whenever I go into a actual smaller business and try and see where they're at. First of all, I have to know what their business is, what they do, how they make money, but the data flow, that's most important I find. So where do you get data and what kind of data is that? So that could be when you hire a person, how is he sending you his SIM? How are you communicating? Are you sending him that personal info just through text message, through phone call? Basically, how is the data flowing and what is flowing? So that's very key to know. So then you could find the actual kind of controls and make sure they are actually there. So following the data, I think is huge. I mean, a vulnerability scan is just key, but that's really from a technical standpoint, right? So you can see where your servers are at in terms of their patches and if your configurations are properly done. So let me stop you there because for some people who might listen to this or watch this, they don't know what a vulnerability scan is. So can you just sure. maybe 30 yep. seconds or less, what is a vulnerability scan? What does it consist of and what's the output? Yeah, sure. So there's a handful of vendors which offer this. It's a very specialized skill. There are people at big companies that all they do is just vulnerability scans all day long. So what this does is it actually plugs into your actual systems. It basically scans all of your servers, all of your hosts. Okay. It basically checks it versus the vulnerabilities which are out there in the current day and it makes sure that everything is up to date. If there was a recent hack which was exposing a certain configuration of a VM machine which you have and if that configuration isn't set, it will flag it. So once it does the scan, it could take from a few minutes to several hours. At the end, you get usually it's a report of various formats, usually a spreadsheet, and you'll get a full report, it could be hundreds of pages of every vulnerability you have, and they'll be segregated by critical, high, medium, low risk. If you have one server even on-prem, you should do that at least once a year. Yeah, that, that's I kind do. of what we recommend our clients or, or pen test. I mean, there's kind of similar kind of and then they're interchangeable. I know people use the terminology interchangeably, but yeah, once a year I think is, is a must nowadays. Because I think things change in an organization. Absolutely. absolutely. I see it as a pen test as a layer further, because then you could really also test things that are non-technical, right? So you could see if it's easy for someone to sneak into the front door. Yes. Is it easy for someone to get into your warehouse from the loading dock? 
whatever weaknesses are potentially there. I put that into the pen test and with the technical side as well. Yeah. Yeah. Those are physical penetration tests where people come on site and actually dress right. up and try to yeah. penetrate your actual business. And a lot of people, when I talk to them about this, they have no idea these things exist. Again, you know, just some of the larger businesses, obviously will we'll know they've done this, but the, some of the smaller businesses who are just, you know, starting their way into cybersecurity, they don't have that uh, level of maturity. So when we start talking about vulnerability assessments, we start talking about pen tests, we start talking about physical access reviews, you know, uh, how does someone walk into your office? Those are basic things. Going back to the earlier thing about awareness, we often talk about awareness in a technical aspect, but we have to also, I think, in my opinion, talk about awareness physically. What's your surrounding look? How are you letting into your office on a daily basis? How easy is it for someone to get from the, from the elevator on your floor to your desk, grab your laptop and walk out? Those are some things that we often overlook. Absolutely. Uh, so those, I think, are important awareness factors that we often forget. Clean desk policy. How many times do we left passwords on a post-it somewhere on your desk? Never me. <laughs> me neither. Me neither. <laughs> but continuing on that vein, if you're doing business with a partner, you have a business, a B2B company, and you walk in and you see their loading dock is a free-for-all. People can walk in and out. Their IT stuff is all over the place. I mean, would that deter you from doing business with that person? I want your honest opinion here. Would, would that be something that would say, you know what? I can't trust these folks. I got to bring my business somewhere else. What would you say about that? Because in our business, it happens a lot. We get due diligence requests. We have to go through regulatory compliance and on a day to day, which is normal for us. What's yeah. your opinion on that? That's a big question. That's like you're balancing growing your business with actually being prudent. Definitely it's wise not to, because you hear so much about attacks to happen from the supply chain. So I'll step back a bit. So basically, let's say your company is hacked, but not directly through you. It could be through a third party, which has access to your systems. And that happens quite a bit. So part of being safe is making sure that who you work with is safe too. You have limited control over what they do. But going back to the original question, I would definitely think twice about doing business with someone who you know is sloppy, maybe never did a pen test and they've been in business for 20 years. Maybe they have the same shared login password for their Windows accounts. This is stuff which I've seen in the smaller yeah. businesses. Yeah, I mean, when we say it, we kind of sound shocked, but at the same time, IT has evolved over time and some practices just, you know, you forget stuff, you set and forget it, right? Mm -hmm. And this is situations where oftentimes it was easier to share a password or share a login with someone versus give them individual rights and so on. So. I mean, I agree with your opinion. I think it's deterring more and more folks uh, of doing business with a, a external party who doesn't meet a certain level of standards. I think it's important, right. frankly, I recommend that. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that. I mean, a lot more due diligence questionnaires. We do that with our suppliers when we're working with them. You know, when we work with a data center, we work with an external party or a consultant. We want to know what kind of individual or party we're working with. I mean, if we're going to be exchanging information about our precious clients, then I think it's important that the level of trust has to be augmented. I think we're going to see more of that. And that leads into my next question. I don't know if this looks like we planned it, but cyber insurance. We talk a lot mm -hmm. about cyber insurance. A couple of years ago, I started talking to, to folks about cyber insurance and they looked at me as if like, why would you need cyber insurance? But what's your opinion on cyber insurance in the small business? I see it more and more every day. People see it as a fail safe. I don't see it that way. But what do you see as cyber insurance being for a small business? I mean, it's definitely not a fail, fail safe. That would be like leaving your house with the door open because yeah. you, you know, <laughs> that yeah, would be, an analogy. Just, yeah, that would be the same for your car. You know, you wouldn't leave your car with the keys inside and the car running and say, ah, oh, I'm just going to. Unless yeah, you really wanted someone to take it. That's a different story. <laughs> but otherwise it's just another layer. I would say it's like, don't make your cyber protection say I have insurance because that wouldn't make any sense. That would be, again, like not locking your doors when you leave your house. And it's definitely becoming more and more of a thing. Businesses are taking it on, but on the flip side, because companies are relying on it so much, now a lot of insurers aren't actually insuring these companies. And they're not giving them policies because they know that they look at it as, oh, I have cyber insurance, so I'll need to get a pen test or a vulnerability scans or do all of this that we just spoke about. So I think we're at a tipping point for the industry. I think insurance com companies are going to be asking more from their potential cl clients, which is great because I mean, that's going to protect the whole, uh, everyone else. So it's going to mm -hmm. force them to step up their game, if you will. So yeah, I mean, it, definitely it's not a fail safe. And the definitely ones that uh, think it is, you could just replay this clip to them. <laughs> well, to your point, we often get requested to help clients who don't qualify. The company will go or enterprise will go and request the cyber insurance policy or renewal. 
or an increase in their coverage and they get denied because again, they don't have the qualifications in place or they don't have the protocols or processes in place to ensure that they're actually a safe business. So you're right, a tipping point has arrived in my opinion. I think uh, insurance companies, newsflash for everybody are in the business of making money. So if you're gonna cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars in payouts yearly, chances are you're not gonna deserve a policy from them. So yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly on this one, Franco. The tipping point has arrived in, in my opinion. Absolutely. And also the rates from what I've here have gone up quite a bit on the renewals. Yeah. So that's something that small businesses have to be ready for. Even big businesses are getting hit with increases now. You know what? Because the fines and the payouts from all these criminals increasing. And to your point, maybe we can just unpack the cyber insurance thing. Cyber insurance is just not someone who pays your bill in case you get hacked. Cyber insurance is definitely a great tool, in my opinion, because it does provide an enterprise the ability to leverage an incident response team and a forensics team in the event something does happen, which a lot of companies don't understand the benefits of. So there is some good things of making sure that you qualify for a great insurance policy so that it can be useful in the event that something happens. You hope it never happens. You hope you never use it like car insurance or or home insurance. But if you are going to have to use it, you want to make sure that that policy is definitely something that you can leverage in a valuable fashion. A couple more questions before I let you go, because I want to respect your time. Data privacy is becoming a huge topic of conversation, all Mm -hmm. verticals, all businesses, businesses of all sizes. You could be a one person shop selling for $5 million on Amazon yearly, B2C. You have 100,000 people's names or emails and credit card information in an Excel file. Is data privacy something you see as a high topic of concern in small businesses? And if it isn't, you know, what's your opinion on that? When should it be? I think as of September 2022, it should be. Yeah. Uh, so we're actually one of the strongest uh, provinces for uh, privacy laws, which is great. And the rest of Canada is going to be following suit. So there's going to be more and more requirements for you to have in place, unless you want to get some really hefty fines. So companies have to step up if they're handling any kind of PII, and which is pretty much most companies, if you have an employee, you qualify. So companies have to take privacy into high consideration and soon legally you'll have to. And if you don't, as I said, the fines are quite high. The government's stepping up their game there. Europe is probably one of the strongest ones with the GDPR. They started that a few years back and it's great to see that we're also stepping up our game. US is still a bit bit fragmented. Every state has their own certain laws, but here at least we're starting to do things in the right way. You've done your homework, Franco. Very nice. Very impressed. You know your data privacy laws. Yeah, and you're right. Fragmented in the US and and even in Canada at a certain level, like Alberta has their own law, BC has their own law, Ontario, Quebec now. We're seeing an emergence of Bill C-26 and Bill C-27 at the federal level, which is still in infancy. It's being tabled and we're trying to push it through. But I think you're right, 100%. As we start seeing those bills and laws put into place, businesses are going to have to take their PII data more more, more seriously. So I think we're all on the right track there. One last question, and this one is maybe one word answer, or maybe you can elaborate on it. But I'm a small business. I come to Franco and I say, what can you suggest to me? I don't have a lot of budget. I don't have a lot of skill. How can I start protecting my business? How do I lower my risk? That's what I want to do. I want to lower my risk. And how do I protect my business knowing that I'm short on budget, short on IT staff? What would you suggest to someone like that? I know you've answered this question several times, so I'm just curious. Yeah, of course. There's a few questions probably I would ask you before we dive into it. So this situation, is there an IT person working at this company or is it kind of a... Good point. A good question. I have a one, you know, one person. I have a role playing now here. I like sure. that. But yeah, I have one person in IT. We're a staff of 100. We have some on premise premises infrastructure and we have some cloud and some SaaS applications. But the individual I have is overwhelmed with just keeping our lights on. What would you suggest to me? Sure. I would say I'm not making any plugs. On no, audit no, no plugs. Yeah, no plugs. So the audit is really a must because, you know, you can know where you're going if you know where you're at. So get a pro to come into your company and he'll look at everything and he'll be able to tell you, is your backup in order? Is your IR process in order? Is your training? Have you ever done trainings? Do you need to do trainings? So he could at least give you a roadmap. And even if that takes two, three, four, five years to put fully into place, at least you have some kind of an an actual roadmap and Mm. a plan. What's going forward? You're pressing on if there's one thing to invest on, I would maybe say instant response because you don't want to be making these decisions under stress. 
you don't want to be waking up at three in the morning and finding out that your servers are locked, the files are all locked, and you can't access anything, then start thinking about what to do. Interesting you say that. I like that. I understand the audit. That's great. So the audit is good, and I'm just going to push back on that. A lot of people are afraid when they hear the word audit. They don't want to know what they don't know. They're afraid to find stuff out. Okay. I've seen that happen many times. Well, do I really need an audit? And it could be a small audit. Does it need to be a big audit? I mean, when you, when you start getting those questions back, then the, the level of maturity is just not where it needs to be. And that's fine. Right. That's why we go through that. But I like what you say about the audit. I think starting with an audit and understanding is probably the best approach. Frankly, I would have probably just went straight into some specific stuff about training or MFA and whatever, but I like that. So like getting a good view of the landscape before diving in is probably the most sensible approach to know where to put your app. You mentioned something about the incident response. So this is just my opinion. And it's a lot of times customers would say, well, how do I protect myself from a ransomware attack? Or how do I protect myself from a cyber attack? Or what should I do for cybersecurity? My number one question has become, well, how long can your operations live without your IT infrastructure being available? So I flipped the question. Now it becomes a business continuity question. The ransomware right. attack is an isolated situation that may or may not impact your operations, right? True. But people just hear cyber attack or they hear ransomware attack and then they panic, right? But I know multiple customers who've had a ransomware attack and were able to restore their backups and they were back up and running within 12 to 18 hours, you know, and they were back up. So that's where I think what your point about incident response is really important because you can make decisions in a panic. Right. And that's where customers, I think, that's where they lose themselves, where they start make, making wrong decisions and impactful decisions in their business when they try to recover their operations and they don't have a plan. So I like that. Okay. Well, that's very good, Frank. You've really educated us here in the, in the last 30 minutes. I appreciate that. That was a really interesting conversation. Do you have any questions for me before we go? This is going to uh, air on our social channels in the next couple of weeks. So I wanted to make sure we've covered everything before we go. No, absolutely. I want, to, I want to thank you for contacting me for this. I think it's great what you and the team are doing. You're putting out great content, very knowledgeable, and you're helping the world, basically. <laughs> I hope so, man. We have a really ambitious goal here at Assurance IT. We've put it up on our website. We want to be able to touch 100,000 businesses. And when we say that, I know we get pushback sometimes, but if I can, through our social channels, if the team can, through our social media and through our social, social channels, whether it be our newsletter, whether it be our social channels and so on, if we can hit 100,000 businesses, and let them know about what we're doing, then at least we've, we've achieved our goal from a social aspect. Absolutely. Maybe important. that's yeah. just the beginning. <laughs> it's just the beginning. I really appreciate that, Franco. You've been awesome. You're a great resource. You know, the customers who have you on board are lucky to have you. And I definitely you. will be recommending you and your services to a lot of the folks I talk to. Perfect. Thank you very much, Luigi. Thank you, Franco. Thank you for listening to 10 Questions to Cyber Resilience, brought to you by Assurance IT. Assurance IT is in the cybersecurity space, specializing in data protection and compliance. Since 2011, they primarily help mid-sized enterprises in Canada. If you have questions about protecting your data, reach out to us directly at info at assuranceit.ca or visit assuranceit.ca.